All right, good morning. Ooh. New mic, new sound people. Figuring everything out. Nathan got it. Nathan's got it. Jedediah got it. Jordan no longer has to sit back there. He can sit somewhere else now. <laughs> He's like, but I lost my job. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know. Well, we've been, trying to, we've been trying to kick him out of there for like the last couple of years, but he, just, he refuses to leave, so I don't know. Well, just, um, yes, yeah, so this is our Thanksgiving Sunday, and uh, just wanted to have an opportunity to kind of look at, well, look at a prayer in the Old Testament. Uh, this, is a, this prayer is from uh, King David, and it's right after the, you know, towards the end of his time, uh, he's preparing all these materials for the temple, and he's prepared in some people's estimates, like five, five billion, is that right? Like five billion dollars worth of gold and silver for the temple, and then because he gives out, he gives a certain amount, and then the people respond, the leaders respond, they give a certain amount, and so we just wanted to look at his prayer and see well, what can we learn um, about how he viewed God and how he saw. Well, why was he so thankful, and then what is that? How can we uh, learn to be that same way? You know, what are some attitudes we can learn from him? So if your Bibles, you can turn to First Chronicles, uh, Old Testament. Um, I have it up here, too. Do you? Hopefully it's readable. All right, so let me read. Uh, this is First Chronicles 29, uh, verse 10. David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly, saying, Praise be to you, O Lord, God of our Father Israel, uh, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, O God, or yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom, and you are exalted as head over all. Right? And if you hear this wording, if you guys know the Lord's Prayer, there, there's some phrases in here that sounds very so familiar or should sound very similar to it, right? The, um, depending which version of the Lord's Prayer, right? It's, uh, from, I had it in my mind, it's the uh, power, um, for yours is the power, and glory forever and ever. Amen, right? That's kind of the end of the Lord's Prayer for some. And it's this idea that David is looking at God, and he said, he's this, is that, you know, God is the king of the kingdom, right? And it's, this is his, his thing. He's looking, at, he's looking at God, and he's like, who, who, who am I? Or who, who is this God I'm following? Who is, what, what, is he, what does he have? What does he own? Right? These are all the, when you think about a God, and if you think about Old Testament, there's people who follow idols, and God always laughs at them. You know, in Isaiah and probably some in the Psalms, he always says, you know, you guys got these idols, and you, you cut this piece of wood, and you bring it home, you chop half of it and use it for firewood, and the other half you form into an idol, and then you bow down to it and say, hey, you know, praise, or you know, give me food, or save me, or whatnot. He says, and God's like, well, what's the... It's so foolish because it's a piece of wood that you burned half and now you're using the other half to worship. And David is pointing out to us, so who is God? What kind of God is it that we follow? Right? And he starts, he puts all these, he puts all these uh, adjectives together, if you will. Right? From everlasting to everlasting. From be there's no beginning and there's no end. He's eternal. Right? He's eternal God. Um, what other kind of God is he? He's greatness. The word greatness there means it's like bigness. It's sort of this idea of stature um, and power. I mean, omnipotent God. He can do whatever he wants. And glory and majesty and splendor. I mean, this is, you know, this is almost like a worship song, right? It's like you just keep adding in. They all have similar meanings, but it's, it's this point of saying, this is how big God is. This is the kind of God that we follow. And not only that, he, he owns everything, right? Everything belongs to him. So when he talks about the kingdom here, when we start in, in like the Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come, thy will be done. The word kingdom there means it's not just, right? it says not just in heaven, <laughs> but it's the whole earth. It's his meaning his, he's sovereign over everything. And in there, he's recognizing this as he, as he recognizes while God is sovereign, he's, he's the Lord. He owns everything. Everything is under his control. The next thing David points out is, well, then, as he's the sovereign, he, you know, by right of being the king, he owns everything. Everything belongs to him. There's nothing that doesn't belong to him. 
Right? He created everything. As, as creator, even in the United States, when you create something, well, if you get it patented, then I guess you can keep it. But if you don't patent it, someone else steals it. But you have this idea of creative rights. And so God here is the creator. He's, everything belongs to him. Uh, but then David goes on. He says, wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. And so this is the, maybe the interesting, not interesting thing, this is the thing about God, though, is that while everything belongs to him, he gives wealth and honor, greatness and strength to everyone else. He's not a, he's not a des despotic God. Is that, a quite, is that a, even an adjective? <laughs> he's not a despot. He doesn't say everything is for me, everything's for my benefit, whatever you have is now mine, and I'm just going to hold on to it. It's, it's like these Scrooge movies, right, that you always have. That he gets all the gold. He gets all, everything in his, in his bank or in his house, and then he doesn't give anything to anyone else. Right? Everyone else is poor. Everyone else is destitute. And God says, no, I'm not that way. I'm not that kind of God. I give to you. Even though it's all mine, I give it to you. Right? I give you wealth. I give you honor. I give you status. Um, I make you a great people. I make you have things, and I give you strength. And it's these might be like, well, these seem so, might be very, seem very far away from you. Um, it's this idea that no matter what we have, God is the one that gives it to us. But here's a, here's a different passage you can look at. Um, this comes out of Deuteronomy. And this is what God tells the people after they get into the promised land. And he says, when you get into the promised land, you're going to have wealth, you're going to have all these things. And remember this, right? You may say to yourself, my power and the strength in my hands have reduced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant, which we swore to our forefathers as it is today. So it's this idea that when we look at God and says, well, what, did, what is God giving? Right? If we go back to this one, he says, what is God giving? He's giving everything to us, right? It's, when we start thinking about, well, what have we achieved in life? It's like, I've gotten into college. It's like, is that your own ability? And you might think, yes. You know, I studied hard. I, I did what I needed to do. And if you remember, if we think about what this passage is saying, it's like, no, God gave you, he, got, he created you, and he put you where you're, you know, he put you in this time and place. He gave you the mind and the ability to do it. He put a family around you that said, hey, going to college is important, so let me help you get there. It's, it's not just you. Right? If you think about working, you know, getting a job nowadays is even harder. I think I used to think it was easier back in the day because you say, hey, this is my resume, this is what I've done. And you can turn it in and say, okay, they'll just they'll grade you on based on what you've written down. But over time, even since my time in college, it's changed to saying, it's not about your resume. It's about knowing somebody that knows somebody that somehow knows you, and they can give you a good word in. Right? There's a connection, this idea of networking. They used to always tell us to do that in college, and you're like, oh, network? What's that mean? How do you talk to people? But if you don't network, if you don't talk to people or talk to people who know other people, you may not know about these job offerings anymore. And even if you do know about it, unless there's someone there that's kind of speak up, can speak up for you and say, hey, here's my, my friend. I know this person. I give you a good personal reference. It's really hard to get jobs. And not to scare you, okay, because you still can get it by your resume partially. But getting your foot in the door, hearing about it, always talks about these networks. Again, who gives you those networks? Who allows you to be in those? And you can always say, this is always the challenge, right? You can always say, no, I did a, I did a really, I, made a, I did a lot of work to get to know these people. And I went and joined the right clubs. I went and joined the right people. I, I went and hung out and schmoozed with whomever. And because of that, I made all these connections. And you can say, no, it's, it's my strength. It's my power. It's my, my, my good nature, my good, my good personality that's allowing me to do that. And we sometimes fail to see that it's, it's God in the background. You know, moving and directing us. 
If you ever look in the book of uh, Esther, if you read them throughout the whole book of Esther, God's not mentioned in that whole book. If you ever, if you ever realize that? The only time is that he's ever realized, that he's ever mentioned, is when Esther goes and talks to Mordecai. And Mordecai says to him, yeah, you don't, for such a time as this, God might have raised you up. Or God might have raised you up for such a time as this. That's the only time God has ever mentioned in the whole book. And so you could always see it as, oh, she just happened to be the beautiful one. She happened to make the right connection with the eunuch. And she just happened to please the king and all these things, right? Coincidence, if you want to live in a different world, a different time and place and relationship with God. But Mordecai is the one that says, no, those weren't coincidences. This does not just happen because you're so pretty. It's happened because God placed you there. And all, so whenever you're in, wherever you're at right now, God has placed you there um, for, for a reason. Um, that's part of our, we have to figure that out. Um, but mostly it's, it's to note that God is the one that did that. And to be thankful for that, to recognize that God has done these things. And hopefully, as we recognize that God has done these things, uh, we give thanks. Here in verse 13, now, God, we give, th give you thanks and praise your glorious name. Right? That when we recognize that, that God has kind of been working either overtly or covertly in our lives, that we then give him praise in public or in private. Right? That's the first part. We, have, we give thanks to God on our own. But we also praise your glorious name, that as we praise God, as we see what he's done in our lives, as he, as he starts doing things, we start praising his name. We say, yes, God, let me praise you. Because what is his name? What's in a name? Right? A name is, means your reputation. So what kind of reputation are we giving God through our praises? What kind of reputation do we give him by what we say and what we do? Right? This idea of witness, this idea that we're saying, as I see God working in my life, let me talk about it. Let me show others what kind of God he is. And so that's what our Thanksgiving service is about. I mean, hopefully we do it more than that, right? <laughs> hopefully it's not just one time a year you recognize oh, that's what God has done. Um, but that we will begin to live more of a, a life of praise that way. But, uh, let me go on. Uh, but who am I? And who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you, and we have, we have given you only what comes from your hand. We are aliens and strangers in your sight, as were all our forefathers. Our days on earth are like a shadow without hope. Right? And it's, uh, it's kind of, David's going a little more in depth here, but he's saying like, we praise God because he realize we have no claim on God or his kingdom. And when, when God blesses us, it's not because we've done anything. <laughs> right? just, if you look at, you know, uh, Elsa was talking about you know, God sending Jesus to die on the cross for us. Did we deserve that? Right? Did, we, did we somehow merit that? Did we somehow do something that's so awesome that God said, well, I have to pay you back, so let me send Jesus. Right? That's the idea of uh, who am I? Who are my people? This is the idea that it, I was thinking, I was trying to think of a, a, a really good example. I was like, I, I can't think of one. The one, one I can remember is, or one thing I can think of is my friend, um, when we were in Portland, he was somehow at a Starbucks. And this, I don't know if you guys know this, uh, Rebecca St. James, she's a Christian artist. And so somehow he had crossed paths with her and she had asked him, oh, can you get a Starbucks? So he went and got Starbucks for them and came back. And he was so pumped up after when he came back. He said, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how he, again, I don't know how they mixed here. He's like, oh, yeah, it was so fun. It's like, I, you know, hope in, in his mind, like, oh, I hope there's a way to keep connecting with her. <laughs> because right, if you think of status and power, if you will, or just influence, she's like untouchable. And he's like, poor seminary student. <laughs> Don't quite match, you know? I mean, yeah, okay, faith-wise, but, you know, don't quite match. He has no, you know, he, he doesn't have any standing before her. And that's kind of this idea here. 
that we that when God blesses us and when God does things in our lives, do we say yes, I deserve that, or do I say, oh, yeah, God is God is amazing. I have no claim on Him. I have no way to force Him to bless me. You know, no matter what I do in life, I I have no way to I have no leverage on Him. I don't pay God. I don't you know, God doesn't need me in a manner of speaking. He loves me and he wants me to be with him, but he doesn't, it's not essential in the sense of like he has, I must do all these things and if I'm not there, his whole kingdom is going to fall apart. Okay, but rather it was we recognize that God loves us and blesses us in spite of maybe what we do, then hopefully we'll be thankful about what he gives us. Right, the, the second part of the passage talks about um, we are aliens and strangers in your sight. This idea that, well, because God owns everything, then there's the aliens and strangers in, in Israel at the time, they had to live on the goodwill of the people of the land, the citizens of the, of the land to provide for them because they, they couldn't own any land. And unless they actually had some kind of business, they were, they were stuck. There was no income. They were, they were destitute on the streets. And they needed people to provide for them. And when God looks at us, he says, yes, that's because you're that way, let me bless you. Right? And then when we actually become believers, we also have this, have to have this attitude of being aliens and strangers in this world. Right? We, don't, we don't belong here. We're supposed to be with God. And then more than that is that the last one. Our days are like a shadow. Our days on earth are like a shadow without hope. If God didn't give us hope, if God didn't give us a promise of a future, that's it. It's all we have. And if, as believers, I think sometimes we, I know I, forget that I have this hope. It's very easy to get just comfortable and say, hey, I, I, I have a future. I'm, I'm not afraid of death anymore. And I'm not afraid of dying. Well, don't want to die. <laughs> But when I, there's this promise of, okay, God, I'm following you. I know that you're real. I feel like I can trust you that when I die, I'll be with you. If you don't have that hope, what is life like? I don't know. It's, it's hard to remember if you've been a believer for a while. But you can get a sense of that if you talk to older folks who are getting older who don't have that hope. They're so deathly afraid of dying. They, they do everything they can to so they don't, they don't die, which is okay. It's not, not saying that you should just give up easily, okay? But there's this aspect of saying, well, what's the point of living? There's, there's nothing else for me. Why should I stay? But when we have hope, when we go, yes, there's this God. He loves me. He's provided for me. I know that he's real. No matter what happens in this life, there's a future for me. I'll be with him forever. Those are the things that God gives us. He blesses us with those things, even when we aren't looking for it. Right? He gives it to us even though we, don't, we can't earn it. I mean, I wish there was, and I wish, it's that when we somehow feel that we are owed something from God, God says, no, do, you, do I really owe it to you? I give it to you out of my love. And it's up to us to recognize that. So this idea of thanksgiving, this idea of honoring God and saying, hey, God, this is, I'm a, you know, thank you for giving me so much. Thank you for working in my life. We need, to gen, you know, we need to continue that, not just in one day, but hopefully that's something that's generated in our lives, throughout our lives, that we're always looking at what God's doing and being thankful for it. So here's a, you know, here to close off. I know, it's short today. I was expecting to do something different, that's why. Here's a thankful next exercise for you. And maybe if you aren't going to stay, hang out for lunch and then stay for afternoon, well, during lunch sharing, <laughs> you guys can think about this. Maybe you guys can share a little bit right now. So the first one is this. Uh, what has been an unexpected blessing for you in the last year? 
Unexpected as in, you didn't expect it. <laughs> it's a surprise, right? Wasn't for us, it wasn't this last year, it was like three years ago, just getting the, the money to go on the sabbatical from, this, from the granting agency. I mean, I heard about it from friends, put in for it, and I was like, wow, hey, they gave us almost $40,000. Wow, crazy. Surprise, here. It still took a while. It took, to, took work to do, but it's like, wow, didn't expect it. So in the last year, what has been an unexpected blessing for you? Something that just like wasn't even on your radar and God dropped it on you. I said, here, this is for you. Okay, second one. Um, in what ways have you seen God? In what ways have you seen God? Man, I wrote that really bad, poorly. In what ways have you seen God give you wealth, status, influence, mental, physical, emotional strength in the last year? Let me say, let's go two years. In what ways have you seen God just show up? I, 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 over, I was overhearing Kevin talking, Kevin Yan talking, and he was just saying that he started working at Olive Garden, and through working there and being, being forced to be social, <laughs> because he's a server, that it, you know, just the interactions, it's like, ah, oh, you know, it just encouraged him because he's a social person, you need a social outlet, you know? For those of us that are more extrovert types, you need people around you, so you gotta go talk to them. For those introvert types, they're like, yeah, a year and a half, I'm not having to deal with people, we're all good, for the most part. But for those that needed people, you know, last year and a half, killer for them. You know, I was just reading that they had more overdoses in the last year than than other things. I mean, it's crazy. But where have you seen God give you these things? Because again, it's not, we may pray for it, we may hope for it, but unless it shows up or God gives us some glimpses of hope, we start depending on ourselves, right? And we get stuck. Unless, so unless God gives it, we don't have it. So where have you seen this? And I know some of you are in a really stressful jobs. How have you seen God show up in there? How have you seen him somehow give you encouragements in the midst of your day? Maybe it's other coworkers. Maybe it's Bible study there. Maybe it's being able to talk to somebody about it. And sometimes it's not just talking. Sometimes it's, it's also somehow being hinted at towards God as saying, hey, you know, God's doing something. Or God's providing. And maybe you're the one that's providing for somebody else. Maybe it's not just someone giving you something, but maybe you're the one providing for somebody else. Where have you seen that? Uh, third one. What have you learned about God in the last year? This is where you actively seeking God out and praying for things and saying, God, you know, help me with this, help me with that. Or, and then God shows up and says, hey, here, let me, let me show you something about myself. Uh, and this last one is, what has God taught you in the last year? These are kind of two different ones. I was trying to figure out the difference. And I, in my mind, there are two different ones. They might kind of be the same. Um, the first, number three, is you actively doing it. You actively seeking God. Um, number four is you were stuck or you were under so much pressure that you really didn't have time to seek out God. But God came and said, this is who I am. So he gives you encouragement without you seeking it. It's just... Again, he just drops it on your lap and says, this is who I am. Know that, know that I love you. Know that I care for you. So hopefully, hopefully one of these sparked something in your mind. <laughs> if not, you guys can go home. That when we think of God and how he blesses, <clears throat> It's not because we are so good or that we follow him so well um, or that we do all the right things that God blesses us. But it's just God in and of himself saying, I love you. Let me give you things. It's like a parent that wants to spoil you. He does give you things. Except God's better. He doesn't give you things you don't need. <laughs> Sometimes we get things we don't always need. But God is good in that way. He gives us exactly what we need. Um, uh, in James, I'll give you one more scripture before we close. 
<coughs> Here, this is James 1, 17. Uh, says this, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Right, this idea that God gives us what we need, and the timing that we need it. He gives it to us freely. He doesn't demand anything from us. And he wants to bless us. And hopefully we can bless him back, praising his name. Um, let me close. Let me pray for us. And if there's anything that you want to share, if you're not going to be here this afternoon, you guys can share. If you're willing to share, you can share it. But let me pray for us first. Lord God, we thank you um, for this time, Lord. Uh, I know we, we should be thankful throughout the whole year. Uh, but Lord, especially during Thanksgiving, Lord, we thank you uh, for the time to reflect a little more, uh, time to look at our lives and, and see your blessings in our lives. Uh, may you, yeah, may you speak to us. May you help us to, to see where you're working, uh, the things that you're doing, so that we praise you. Lord, we thank you. We praise in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so now you guys have a time of sharing. If you so desire... Um, I don't have a movable mic, so you might have to just stand up and yell or speak loudly.